Well, I want to extend a very warm welcome to everybody this morning as we meet together at Stornoway Free Church. And our prayer is that we will all know the blessing of God as we come under His Word. We're going to begin uh, by singing, it's a recorded singing of Psalm 48, Psalm 48a, and at verse 9, <clears throat> We contemplate your steadfast love within your house, O God, for, like your name, your praise extends through all the earth abroad. All that you do is righteous, Lord. Mount Zion's joy is great. And Judah's towns rejoice as they your judgment celebrate. Round Zion walk and count her towers, view every citadel, so that to children yet unborn her story you may tell. For God the Lord, who is our God, forever will abide. He is our God forevermore, and to the end. Our guide. So we're going to sing these verses of Psalm 48 a We contemplate your steadfast love. <clears throat> we contemplate your steadfast love within your house, O God. For like your name, your praise. gracious God, as we bow before you this morning, we pray that we might know you, that we might know you more, uh, even than we knew you the last week. We give thanks, Lord, that your word reminds us that we are to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And we pray that that might be true in our experience and that we will grow in that, in that grace and grow in that knowledge that we will always be seeking and searching in your word, so that we will come to a greater understanding of who you are, that your word will shed light into our hearts, so that by our own experience married to your word, there might come within our lives a greater understanding of the, the majesty and the dominion, the authority, the glory, the power, the grace, the love, the peace, just so many aspects of your being that this may become uh, more understanding in our own thinking and that you will richly bless us. We give thanks, Lord, for every day that we can come under your word. And we pray that every day it might be part of our lives, that every morning we may, may begin with your word because it is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy you. Help us, Lord, to look to you to guide us as we journey through life, as we face all its challenges, sometimes difficulties, sometimes things that uh, really perplex us and confuse us, times we really don't know just what to do. There are times we come to a standstill, we face a wall of difficulty and we're just not sure what to do. 
we feel we can't go forward and there doesn't seem to be a way to go either other way. So we ask, Lord, that you will help us at these times. We live in strange times, difficult times, uh, where so much of life as we knew it has been turned on its head. And we find that life is very restrictive and it causes with the restrictions uh, so many added and, uh, new problems and new challenges within our lives. Things that we took for granted, things that we didn't even think about before are now things that sometimes we can no longer do and uh, we find these restrictions difficult. And so we pray for grace. We need lots of grace at this time and that you will help us through, through everything. Uh, we pray in particular for those who mourn and we're, we're just so aware that there have been so many deaths of late and again even in the whole area of uh, death and uh, bereavement and all that that entails the, the restrictions make things uh, so difficult so that many of the, the, the ways that we're used to and the ways that we want to express our sorrow and our sympathy uh, with others we're no longer able to do. But, O oh Lord, we ask that you will give an abundant sense of your grace and help and hope uh, to those whose hearts are broken. And so we ask for healing and for help upon every broken heart uh, today. We pray for those who are ill and uh, those who are laid aside through all the different illnesses of life. And uh, particularly remember all those who have been affected by the COVID uh, pandemic and here again, even in, in the Western Isles, which uh, for so long we felt a sense of uh, maybe we were taking things for granted at a few cases there were. But as this outbreak has taken place, Lord, we pray for your protection. We pray for your strength and grace to be given. And we pray that uh, your healing hand may be upon us, that you will deliver us and that we will look to the God of heaven and earth. Oh, Lord. May your helping, upholding, healing hand be upon each and every one. We pray for all who are ill. We commit them to your care and keeping. Pray your blessing upon all uh, hospital staff and upon all our carers, uh, those who are working, particularly those who are working, uh, putting their own, often their own lives at risk and just the whole knock-on effect that that can uh, have. And we ask, Lord, for protection. We pray, Lord, upon us nationally and internationally at this time, because it's not only here, but the, the whole world has changed. Help us to remember that uh, we live in a very fragile world. And help us to remember that you are God of time and God of eternity, that you are God of the nations, and that you raise up one nation and you cast another nation down, and uh, that you alone are the one who rules and overrules everything. Help us to understand that. May our leaders understand that. Lord, may those in authority over us come to a come to an understanding, just like Nebuchadnezzar did, uh, that the God of heaven and earth rules. That great monarch in Babylon who refused to acknowledge the God of heaven and earth, there came a time when he had to say uh, that the God of heaven and earth, that he does according to his will, with the armies of heaven and with the inhabitants of the earth. And who could stay his hand? And may our leaders come to realize this as well. O oh Lord, our oh God, we pray then that, that you will bless us. Bless your word to us. Bless our young people. Bless our Sunday schools. Bless all the work that is done in, homes, in homeschooling. Bless our teachers and all the extra pressures that they are under. And we pray that you will be with, with all, be with parents as they seek to teach at home and be with our young, our, our children, because it's it's a strange experience for them. It's something we've never experienced. And as they're cut off so much from their own friends and all the interaction that they're used to, and we pray, Lord, that you will bless them. Keep them strong in mind and in body. And we pray then that we might hear your word, that you will open the word of truth to us today. Have mercy upon us and cleanse us from our sin. We we stand confessing your sin before you today. Uh, we sin against you in thought and word and in deed. And uh, we have to confess that even our very thoughts are twisted. There's so much corruption within us. But we give thanks that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. Then we ask that you will be gracious and merciful to us. And forgive us our sin in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. 
And just a wee word to the young people. Um, this week I was looking for a, a wee piece of paper, something that I had written on. It was actually it was a very important piece of paper because it, it was something I really needed to have. Now, if you come into my study, one of the things, if I was to open the drawers of the filing cabinet and to open the drawers of the desk, you would say, whoa, because there is an awful lot of paper in there. Sometimes it's bits of cards, sometimes it's note paper, sometimes just ordinary uh, sheet of paper, but I have, I have written so much. There's, there are, let me tell you, there are thousands of pieces of paper, of card, of notes, sermon notes, various things in there. And sometimes uh, there's things scattered all over the study, much to my wife's, Dolly's horror. Sometimes she comes in and, oh, she said, what a mess, all the papers. And I, I would love to say, I think somebody came in and scattered them all over the place. It wasn't me, but it was, of course, it was me. But I was, I needed this piece of paper and I searched and I searched and I searched and I searched and I went through everything. I was going through all the papers and I was at it for over an hour and I was into the second hour and by that time I was beginning to get everybody grumpy and frustrated and annoyed and fed up because I needed to get it and I was baffled and I was in the, going around and I was getting as I say, getting really wound up about it. And then I sat down on the chair in front of the desk, and you know what I did? I said, Lord, please, please help me to find this piece of paper. It's important. I need it. And you know, when I prayed that, I felt really, really bad. Because as far as I'm aware, that was the first time that I'd actually asked God to help me to find that piece of paper. You see, when I went to get it, I thought I'd find it, no, it straight away, and I just went and I started. But I, I put all my mind, all my energy, all my concentration was going into trying to find this piece of paper, which I thought I was bound to find. And I realized I, I, I'm stuck. I can't find it. And I felt really bad. In fact, I, I actually didn't think I would tell you about this because it's going to make me look really bad that it was only at the very end that I asked the Lord. Now, I have to say, thankfully, that in many, many things in life, I begin with prayer, and I do ask the Lord to help, to guide, to show, to do like that. But we make the mistake sometimes with what we look at as the little things. It's only a piece of paper. So you go in and say, well, I'll have to get this wee bit of paper. The Lord was showing me, I can get that piece of paper for you if you ask me. But I didn't, because I thought I would be able to find that piece of paper myself. And after an hour, or more than an hour of searching, it's then I said, Lord, help me to find this piece of paper. And you know, within two minutes I found it. And I sat down again in the chair and I thanked God for helping me to find the piece of paper. And I asked God to forgive me for being so slow once again to learn. That in, you know what the Bible says, seek first, yeah, seek first the kingdom of God and all the other things will be added. Seek and you will find. We're told in everything, to bring everything to the Lord in prayer. And just like I discovered, you will discover the importance of bringing every start your day with the Lord. And you make sure that in all the things, not just the big things, yes, we, it's so easy to pray about the big things in life. But the little things are important as well. So in, as the Lord says, in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. In everything, bring everything to the Lord in prayer. That's where our faith grows. That's where we see God's hand at work. So remember, seek and you shall find. Put the Lord first in everything. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
Let us read God's Word now from the book of Ruth, and we're going to read chapter 2. We read a wee bit from Leviticus last week, and then we read uh, uh, the first part of chapter 2. But we'll read the whole chapter today, because uh, we're going to look at this chapter maybe in more detail. Ruth chapter 2. Now, Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain, after him in whose sight I shall find favour. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to, to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came, and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field, or leave this one, but keep close to my young woman. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping, and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, why have I found favour in your eyes, that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favour in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me, and spoken, you have spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. And at mealtime Boaz said to her, Come here, and eat some bread, and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed to her roasted grain. And she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. And also pull out some from the bundles for her, and leave it for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, The man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. And Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, You shall keep close to my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that you go out with this young woman, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young woman of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvests, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Amen, and may God bless to us this reading of his own holy word. And I want us today to focus on the words of verse 12. While we're still looking at the chapter, but in particular verse 12, the Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, 
under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Now, as we saw this, as we've been looking at this book, this little book, the book of Ruth, just four chapters, we know it's a book that we've seen this, a book of sorrows and tragedies, but it's also a book that is full of love. We saw the tragedy in Moab where uh, Elimelech and Naomi, with their two sons, tied her on away from the famine that was in Israel, a famine that was allowed by God as part of his judgment against his people to bring them back. And uh, as we saw before, they were wrong to try and run away from God. You can't run away from God. Jonah tried to run away from God, and he very nearly lost his life in the sea. Uh, we know how God sent this great whale, this great big fish, to swallow him up. And as somebody once said, if you'd run away from God, there might not be a whale to swallow you up like Jonah. And it's a lesson for all of us to learn that it's, it's pointless trying to run from God. We need to learn to submit before God. And uh, that's what, unfortunately, Naomi and Elimelech hadn't done. But then we saw, of course, how tragedy struck in, in, uh, in Moab and of how Elimelech and the two sons died. And Naomi, when she heard that uh, God had come back, visited his people and giving food, she and the two daughters-in-law uh, left Moab to return to come to, to Israel. You remember how there came a point where Orpah returned back to her own ways, to her own gods, to her own culture, to her own people. But Ruth committed completely to Naomi. Where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God is my God. So Ruth had thrown in her lot absolutely with Naomi. Now last week we saw Ruth going out to glean in the fields and we saw that God had made provision. Remember we saw this, how God had made provision for those who didn't have. And whenever fields were being reaped, whether it was barley or wheat or whatever, they weren't to reap right into the fence as, as it were. They were to leave a chunk which was for the widows and the poor and as they were gathering the sheaves and all that would be falling, they weren't to pick it up. They were to leave it for the ones come behind, the gleaners who would come and they would glean the harvest so that they would get. So provision was being made this way for the widows and for the poor. So that's where we found uh, Ruth had gone out uh, to glean. And she didn't know, she just went and we saw that she just happened to come, as it were, to the field of Boaz. And uh, we remember how we saw there that uh, it wasn't just happened. She was di divinely directed to that particular field because there was all round her, there were different fields being reaped. But she was led, without a doubt, though she didn't know it, she was led by God to this particular field because Boaz was of Elimelech's family. And we'll see again how vital and important that is. And of course, when Boaz comes and he sees this woman, he asks, who, who is this woman? And he's told by the foreman, that's a young woman that came back with Naomi from Moab. And she hasn't stopped working all day apart from having one little rest. And uh, Mo, uh, Boaz goes over to Ruth. And Boaz had heard everything about her and how good she was to her mother-in-law, how good she was to the memory of Elimelech, his near relative. And Boaz was a good man, a worthy man, we're told, and he, was, he would have been good in character, he was good in standing, good in every way. And he was deeply touched and moved by how good Ruth had been, how she had left everything and had come to support her mother-in-law. And it had, it had touched Boaz's heart. And Boaz went over to Ruth. Now, as we go through the story, we will find that there comes a point where Ruth and Boaz marry. But you know, there's part of me thinks. Now we hear the expression love at first sight. And it does happen. It doesn't happen too often, but it happens. And I kind of think there was almost an element of that in Boaz. Uh, maybe not as powerful as that, but anyway, he was determined he was going to look after this young woman who had done so much for his family. And so 
uh, we find that he is so kind to her. And uh, Boaz is, is uh, uh, as it were, he's been so nice and gentle and caring and kind. And in fact, R Ruth is kind of overcome by this. And that's why she says to, to him in verse 13, I have found favour in your eyes, my Lord, for you have, I love this word, you've comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. Isn't that lovely? You've comforted me. You know, this was a pivotal day in, in Ruth's experience. This was the first day that she could have felt completely safe in Israel. Remember, she she had no rights. She, she, anybody could have harmed her, and there would be no voice to stand up for her. But all of a sudden, here's a man, a man of position, a man of authority, a worthy man in the city, and he has told everybody, you do not touch. And his words carried authority. You do not touch that woman. For the first day, she could feel absolutely safe. She felt protected. That sense of vulnerability was beginning to fade away. She felt valued. She felt a sense of worth. Things that she hadn't probably felt for a long time. Because Boaz was so good. And she was being comforted by that. And you know, as you look back in life, there are pivotal moment, moments in our lives where a kind of future hinges on a particular time of something that maybe somebody has done or something that somebody has said or some experience that we've had. It's been a life-changing, as it were, moment. Well, this certainly was so for Ruth. And we find Ruth going when she went back home and she was, she was telling Naomi, because Naomi would have seen the amount of stuff she gathered. And Naomi didn't, uh, Ruth didn't just come home with uh, all that she had gleaned, but she came home with food. And Naomi was asking, where? And, and Ruth, where did the, what happened? How did you get all this? And listen to Naomi, because when uh, Ruth talks about, about Boaz, we find Ruth, uh, Naomi saying, may he be blessed by the Lord. Now that's, an, that's also another pivotal moment in the experience of, of these ladies. Naomi is back. Oh yes, we know she's back to Bethlehem. But she's back spiritually. Because up until this moment, all she could feel about was that God was against her. God's hand was against her. She felt that she was nowhere. You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be hearing any words of blessing coming from Naomi's lips, but it's changed. You see, this is, for her, she is back spiritually. She's now blessing God. She's asking that this man be blessed. You see, God is working in Naomi. He's been working all the time. She didn't realize it. And maybe she still doesn't realize it. But her voice is changing because her heart is changing. Her words are changing because her heart is changing. And that's what God does for us. He doesn't leave us in the hole. He doesn't leave us in the far country. He doesn't leave us in that place. He's busy at work. You ask the Lord to make sure that he's drawing you back to himself, to restore, to restore you, to lift you up. And you'll notice that then the conversation in this chapter between Ruth, uh, all the conversations between Ruth and Naomi and Boaz, are, they're, they're, they're great conversations. But it's a bit, verse 12 that I want us really to focus on in particular, where Boaz says, The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by, by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. And all that is happening here in the way that Boaz is providing for Ruth, and this whole story has always been looked upon uh, by the church as a picture of Christ and his bride, of Christ and his people, of Christ and the church. And uh, the church has always looked at it in this particular way. And that's what I want us to consider just for a little here. Because in this, we see, if we're looking at this as a picture of how the Lord deals with us and the way that Boaz has dealt with Ruth, 
the very first thing we see here is that Boaz takes all the initiative. It's Boaz who comes to Ruth. Here's this woman who has nothing. She has no rights. She has no privileges. She has no standing within the community. She's vulnerable. She's on her own in a big, wide world. And you've got to remember that the Moabites were one of the nations that Israel had absolutely nothing to do. And you know what? That's exactly what the Lord has done with you. And if you're following the Lord today, that's exactly what the Lord has done with you as well. Because you were just like, like Ruth. You had no privileges. Same with me. No rights, no status, no nothing before. We weren't part of God's kingdom. We had no claim upon God. <laughs> you know, sadly, sometimes we can, away back in our ignorance, think that we do have a claim upon God. You know, maybe you see today, maybe you're like how I once was. But I thought that I had some kind of claim upon God because of who my parents were, that they were Christians. And I would say to the, in my own heart, well, I've been brought up in a good home. I was baptized and I was brought up in the church and I went to Sunday school and I've gone to church and I give, I give money to the church and all that. And I would think through that that I had a claim upon God and God would look down upon me and look on me favorably and say, okay, yeah, you've done your part, it's all right. <laughs> no, it doesn't work like that. We have nothing. We have we have nothing. We have nothing that we can say to the Lord. That's what you remember what the, the hymn says. Nothing in my hand I bring. I have nothing. Lord, I have nothing. And it's into that nothingness that the Lord comes. He takes the initiative. And if you find today in your heart that there is a warming to the gospel, a warming to the things of God, if there's a a drawing in your heart, a desire in your heart to become a Christian. That's not from yourself. You don't have that in and of yourself. That is the initiative. That's God taking the initiative in your life. Thank him for that. But don't stop there. And so we find that uh, we, and you know, the Boaz is a picture of grace. He comes, he didn't need to, but he does. And he's giving, he's giving, he's giving. And you know, even to this very day, I still find grace hard to understand. Because we live our lives with a sense of rights and wrongs, with, with a sense of reward and of uh, deserving and all these kind of things. Well, I deserve this. See what I did? I can... We, we have this sense of deserving and of rights and of status and standing and all the different things. And so, well, you know, I, I, I deserve to have this known. But grace cuts across that. And that's why we can't understand God's kindness to us. Because we say, well, Lord, I don't deserve that. But that's grace. At no point anywhere is there deserving come into it. Grace is God's it's the unmerited, undeserving favour that he bestows upon us. And then we find that Boaz comes and he speaks to Ruth. And that's exactly what God has done with us as well. Because we're told in Hebrews, God has in these last days spoken to us by his son. God came. He spoke to us. He gave us the word. Wow. You know, that we, for most of us, we've grown up with the word and we're used to it. But what, a, what an honor, what a privilege that God has given us his word where he is revealing to us who he is, revealing to us who we are, revealing to us how to get right with him. And he has, that's what, it, what we're told, God has in these last days spoken to us by his son. Jesus came and Jesus spoke to us. And so this is again all part of of God's grace in giving us the word. This Bible is the greatest book that this world has ever known or ever will know. And it's appalling how there are people who, who do not want the Bible to be part of society. It's, it's quite extraordinary that people are saying, get rid of the Bible, get rid of the Bible. When we get rid of, trying to get rid of the Bible, it's saying we don't want God. 
You know, it's, it's the most awful thing that can happen. People are saying, I don't want to hear what God has to say. They don't want to even hear his message of grace. Well, the sad thing is this. If people do not want to hear the message of God's grace, and they close their ears to the message of God's grace in life, you know what? They're still going to have to hear God speak because they will hear in eternity God's message of judgment personally to them. It's a fearful thought. That's how it is. And that's why we need to pray for people who have closed their mind to the truth and are trying to push the Bible away. Rather than condemn them, we need to pray for them that their eyes will be opened to see what it is that they're doing. But today is a day of grace. God is speaking to us today, speaking to you, speaking to me through his word. And so just as Boaz began to provide for Ruth, so the Lord has begun to provide uh, for us as well. And Boaz gives this beautiful description of where Ruth finds herself, the God of Israel under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Now, of course, that's a spiritual reference because God, as we know, as a spirit, doesn't have wings as such. But a lot of the Bible uses imagery or uses words to help us to understand how it is that God deals with us. And he's looking, we're picturing there, these, like the, the like a mother bird, uh, the great big broad wings, strong wings, and they're there protecting, they're these wings that surround, and they're there where you're able to hide under. And that's what happens when we come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're told, your life is hidden in Christ. We're hidden in Christ. You, today, as a believer, are as safe as... You can't be safer. You're in the safest place. You know, there are people in this world who are the most incredible high-tech security fences and cameras and all kinds of things. That their homes are just like huge forts and castles and just to keep intruders out and they sometimes with all the high-tech protection that they have they say what i feel pretty safe here well they're nothing near as safe as a believer who is under the shelter of christ you're the safest place in this world there is no force or power in this world or even in hell that can rip you out of the hold of Christ. He has you safe, safe for time and safe for eternity. I know there are times that sometimes we feel vulnerable and insecure and such like. Ask the Lord to give you again a sense of his own divine care and love uh, for you. And you know, he, he, he's, he's looking after his people all the time. He, the, remember the God who's watching over you. The God who shut the, the lion's mouths in the den. The God who ordered the ravens to go and feed Elijah. The God who parted the waters of the Red Sea. The God just in a moment who does this, that and the next thing. All power belongs to him. That's your God. That's my God. That's a God who's watching over us under whose wings we have come to rest. But the wings aren't just strong and broad. They're also soft. When you think of wings, you think of feathers, and feathers are so soft and warm. And again, that's a picture that we have. Remember how Christ is weeping over Jerusalem, and he's giving the, the picture of, like the mother, the mother hen, how she would take her brood and under her wings. The place of not only security and safety, but the place of warmth, the place of love. And that's what the Lord does to us. Because he takes us in and he, he, he gives us this sense of the sense of belonging, this sense of love, his love, his peace, his joy. He imparts that all this to us because he comes to live within us. And so this is all part of the, the, the wonder of coming to rest under his wings. And so, as we said, the Lord is protecting us, just as Boaz is saying about how the Lord, how she's come to rest and under the wings there's this protection. Sometimes we forget how how intimate the union is 
between ourselves and the Lord. But remember what it says. This is what God says. Whoever touches you touches the apple of my eye. The most tender, sensitive part that you can get is right there in the very centre of your eye. And God's saying anybody who touches you is touching, as it were, that uh, sensitive part of me. That's how close it is. And so the Lord the Lord is also just like, like uh, Boaz was providing for Ruth. He gave her the best. He was saying to the reapers, hey, drop some, drop some of the... Of the of the the wheat and the the barley, drop it deliberately for Ruth who's coming behind you. And he gave her of his own food. Remember, he dipped the morsel in the wine. Said, "On you go, salted grain. On you go." And he gave her so much that there was le- food left over to take. She was satisfied to take home to her mother-in-law. It's a wonderful story, isn't it? And you know, at this moment, I believe when Ruth is saying, you know, Boaz, you've comforted me. And I think we are here at this one of the the great moments because, yes, Ruth has had sorrows and pains and heartaches in her life. But she's moved on. And not that there will always be a sorrow. There will always be a pain. There will always be a loss because of the loss that she experienced. But, you know, if we dwell there, if if we get stuck there, And if we just keep looking in on ourselves, we'll never be able to move forward. And you know, when we look, if if we've gone through a difficult time, and we all do at different levels. Now, I'm not, don't get me wrong. Some people, probably who are listening today, have gone through harrowing experiences. And I don't want in any shape or form to minimize the pain that you have gone through, through your losses, through your pains and sorrows. But you know, it's important that we don't just look in on ourselves all the time because if so we will end up just wallowing in self-pity at all the different levels in life that's what happens if we never get out of there we're we're stuck and so at this moment though Ruth could that's where Naomi had been stuck but Ruth falls at the feet of Boaz and as Ruth does that she sees all the future that is in Boaz that she hears his words, his promises. She hears, sees the provision that is made. And that's how you and I must go forward in life, is looking to Jesus. There's an old uh, we rhyme I remember reading, and it says, look at self and be distressed. Look at others and be depressed. But look to the Lord and you'll be blessed. And there's an element of truth in that. That if we just look in, we get quite distressed. And when we can look at others and their lives going well, we can. and if you're having a hard time, you can get depressed. It's important sometimes to take our eyes up and look look at Jesus and see, listen to his words and discover all the resources that are there and everything that he has for us, all the provision that is made. And so this chapter is a wonderful chapter where we're seeing a change, change in Ruth, change in Naomi, And this is the Lord who will change your life for the better. And you make sure that you come also, like Ruth did, to rest under the wings of the God of Israel. It's the safest place in the entire world. Lord our God, we pray that all of us may indeed truly rest under the God of Israel, that he will be our shield and our shelter, our guide and our shepherd. Take away our sin in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to conclude singing from Psalm 85. Psalm 85, sing Psalms, uh, verse 8 to the end. I will hear what God the Lord says to his saints. He offers peace. But his people must not wonder and return to foolishness. Surely for all those who fear him, his salvation is at hand, so that once again his glory may be seen within our land. Love and truth have met together, righteousness and peace embrace. Righteousness looks down from heaven, from the earth springs faithfulness, and so on. I will hear what God the Lord says to us.
the grace, mercy, and peace, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest and abide upon each one of you now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you very much for watching and being part of our service today. And do remember the evening service tonight conducted by Reverend James McKeever and that service is at 6.30 p.m. And God bless you all. Mm -hmm.